before listening to this sermon, if you could please read Matthew chapter 19, verses 13 to 30. I'm going to look at three things. The lie, the truth, and the transformation. So firstly, the lie. Over the last few months, there has been a lot of ridiculously large amounts of money spent on various things. For example, Jeff Bezos, who the founder of Amazon, he spent over a billion pounds on a 11-minute space flight. Also, someone paid 1.2 million pounds for an unopened computer game from the 90s. Someone else bid £2,000 on eBay to buy an imaginary friend. How do you explain these decisions that seem so ridiculous to the rest of us? Is it as simple as saying that these people have more money than sense? More money than sense. That is so often the reason we give to explain such seemingly ridiculous purchases. But is it really that simple? Could you really describe the likes of Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos as stupid? Surely people who have made that much money must be good at thinking things through and making good decisions. Likewise, the rich young ruler that we meet in chapter 19 was anything but stupid. He was young, making lots of money in a short space of time, most likely through using his brain. He was a ruler, someone who had been recognised by others as being good at making decisions. And yet, the Gospel writer, Matthew, describes him as going on to make the worst decision in the world, turning his back on Jesus, despite knowing the eternal consequences of his decision. So, more money than sense? Did this rich man simply have more money than sense? Or is there something more going on? Is there something about worldly stuff that attracts us and blinds us, regardless of our IQ, and regardless of us being rich or poor. I'm just going to do a little quiz for a moment and see if you are a sensible person. If I have £10 and then spend £2 on sweets, and then I get given another £3, and then spend half of that three pounds on sweets, did I have more or more money or less money than I had at the start? I have ten pounds, I spend two pounds on sweets, then I get given another three pounds, and then I spend half of that three pounds on sweets. If you've done your calcula calculations right, you should find out I have less than I began with. I have £9.50 at the end. Now another calculation. Picture a pair of twin brothers, Adam and Bob. Dad gives Adam £10 and then gives Bob £10. Does Adam have more money or less money than he had at the beginning? Obviously he's got more, he had nothing at the beginning. Ten seconds later, Dad gives Bob another £10. Does Adam have the same amount of money that he had ten seconds ago? Yes, he still just got £10. But how come he now feels like he's got less? In his head, Adam knows that he has the same amount of money as he had before. But in his heart, he now feels like he has less. Adam feels like he has less because he's jealous of his brother. And so rather than enjoying what he does have, he spends the rest of that day com complaining. And the rest of the week, he's occupied with trying to get an extra £10 because he believes that it is the only thing 
that will bring him joy. We've all been there, haven't we? And I don't just mean when we were kids. Something in our hearts makes us spend our lives thinking about all the things we don't have. Something in our hearts makes us spend our life pursuing the earthly things that we, that we think will bring us joy. We are just as much influenced by these things as the super, super rich. So what is our problem? And most importantly, what is the cure? Well, in verses 18 to 21, Jesus explains the source of our problem. In response to the question, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Jesus replies, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honour your father and mother and love your neighbour as yourself. Jesus, I think, does the equivalent of saying fee, fi, fo, or the equivalent of saying snap, crackle, and, or do, re, mi, fa, so, la. Jesus deliberately leaves out some of the Ten Commandments so that we'll think about the ones he's missed. Just like you before were probably thinking he'd forgot to say fum, or if you he, forgot to say pop, or he forgot to say tea. Jesus deliberately leaves out some of the Ten Commandments so that we'll immediately think about the ones that he's missed. So which of the Ten Commandments has Jesus left out? Well, Jesus mentions five out of the six commandments that relate to other people, deliberately leaving out the command about envy. Envy being that strong feeling that makes us crave earthly wealth, satisfaction and success. Why do we feel these strong feelings? Well, know what Jesus, that Jesus leaves out all the, other, all the commandments that relate to God. Jesus leaves all the commandments that relate to God out. In other words, we feel these strong feelings of envy because we've turned our back on God. Instead of looking to God as the true source of security and satisfaction, we seek security and satisfaction in other things. For the rich man, his functional God was money. The rich man looked to money for security, believing that to have money meant to be safe. The rich man looked to money for satisfaction, believing that to have money meant to discover joy. The rich man looked to money to make him feel as if he was a somebody. The rich being somebody's, successful, valuable and significant. The poor being nobody's people of little value or worth. Now, you may not look for these three things in money, but we all look for these things in other things. We've all bought into the lie that in order to be a somebody, we need to be a success or achieve or win the esteem of others. We've all bought into the lie that ultimate satisfaction can be found in earthly things. We've all bought into the lie that something other than God is our ultimate source of security, thinking we must have it to feel safe. So, as homework, I'd really encourage you to think about your three S's. What do you look to for satisfaction? What do you look to help you feel secure? What makes you feel like a somebody or a nobody? The things that you come up with are very likely your functional gods. So, we've all believed the lie that things other than God can give us security and satisfaction. We believe these lies, but what is the truth? Well, the truth. Now, I'd just like you to imagine Bob going with his first £10 to tap pound land. What think about what he might come out with? Now, picture Bob going with his other £10 and going to Marks and Spencers. What do you picture in his bag when he leaves? 
Well, if you go to Pounds Land, land with ten pounds, you leave with a bag full of stuff. Lots of ten, one pound, things of one pound worth in value. It, you get a lot of quantity at Poundland, but not as much quality. Your ten pounds gets you a lot, but what you get is usually poorly made. At M&S, however, you leave with a bag with probably something very small at the bottom. Quality, but not much quantity. Your £10 doesn't buy you very much, but what you get is top-notch. Quantity and quality. You can usually get one, but not both. I'd like you to keep that in mind as we read through some of these verses again. Verse 16. A man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what must good thing must I get do to get eternal life? This rich man's question seems to be more about quantity. He wants to know what he must do to, so that his life continues forever after he dies. An extension of his rather good earthly life is basically what he's after. There's nothing wrong with that, but there is more. Jesus replies, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor. Then come follow me. Jesus asks the rich man to sacrifice everything that makes his earthly life, earthly life quality. But why do this? Let me read 21 in full. Jesus says, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then, come follow me. Jesus doesn't just offer the rich man an eternal life that is a mere extension of his earthly life. Jesus offers him the gift of eternal life that is both quantity and quality as well. Jesus speaks of treasure, not length. Jesus speaks of treasure, not length. The riches and joy of heaven are greater than anything we might experience on earth. In fact, Jesus goes on in verse 29 to describe the riches of eternity to be a, worth a hundred times more. Jesus said to them, that's his disciples in verse 28, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, he continues, Everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. Jesus offers you and I eternal life, a life of great quantity and length because it is infinite. Jesus offers you a hundred times more an eternal life of such quality that it is described as a hundred times greater than anything and everything else. Specifically, Jesus refers to those who gave up costly things in their earthly lives to follow him, such as family and property. Jesus promises them that their losses will be fully made up in eternity. But I think this verse, along with other verses in the Bible, imply a general principle that the quality of eternal life is a minimum of a hundred times better than the best we might experience now. Imagine your favourite meal, but a hundred times more tasty. Imagine music that lifts your heart a hundred times higher than it does now. Imagine knowing the love of a father that is a hundred times deeper than any other love you could ever experience. You know, if you ever find yourself debating if following Jesus is worth it, this is the truth you need to remember. The treasure, the joy, the satisfaction Jesus offers you in eternity is one hundred times greater than anything you might have to give up. So, 
If you ever find yourself complaining about the earthly things you've missed out on, remember that this missing out won't continue forever. Be it earthly riches or an earthly, earthly relationship, in eternity Jesus offers you and I more. Now just a note, I don't think by using the words treasures in heaven, Jesus is, is suggesting that God has some kind of heavenly currency system by which he gives us gold and silver and bronze to play with. I think Jesus is simply trying to give us a sense of the worth, the infinite value of being with God forever in a place saturated with joy. So we've looked at the lie, the truth, and now the transformation. This is the truth. God, not money, offers us true security and satisfaction. Not fully experienced in this life, but fully experienced in the next. This is the truth. But the other truth the Bible speaks of is that we all spend our lives believing lies. This is what we see in verses 21 to 22. Jesus, um, 21. If you want to be perfect, Jesus said to the rich man, go, sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Just a question for you. Was this man a believer or an unbeliever? Difficult question. If this man was a complete unbeliever, he would have left Jesus laughing, perhaps mocking the idea of God and heaven, or perhaps laughing off the idea that eternity could really be so great. But the rich man didn't leave laughing. He left sorrowful. He in some sense recognised that he was turning his back on something really good. Perhaps in his head he recognised the lies of earthly riches, promising much, but all too often failing to deliver. I mean, who of us hasn't wanted something, then got it only to be disappointed? Who of us hasn't enjoyed something, only for that joy to be short-lived? Perhaps in his head the rich man recognised the lies of earthly riches. Perhaps in his head the rich man recognised that what Jesus said was true. And yet what does this near-to-believing rich man do? He left sorrowful, unable to stop believing the lies about earthly riches, incapable in, in some sense of pulling himself away from the lie in order to believe the truth. You may not be rich, or young, or a ruler, but maybe, like me, you find this man's story relatable. I've become so caught up in the lies about earthly stuff that I get distracted by them. They consume my thoughts and priorities. I've so been caught up in the lies about earthly stuff that I cling on to them. If God, God's word calls me to make sacrifices, I resist. I complain when I don't have earthly stuff, and I think I'll only be happy when I do. Now don't get me wrong, there is nothing wrong with enjoying something or taking pleasure in any of the good things God has given us, such as food, music, laughter, relationships. Enjoy them, but don't swallow them. Treat them like chewing gum. Enjoy them, but don't swallow them. Enjoy them, but don't swallow the idea that this world can fully satisfy you. Enjoy these things, but don't swallow the idea that they are what life is all about. But the problem is, we have swallowed such lies. In our heads, we might recognise the false promises of earthly riches. In our heads, we might know the truth about the goodness and greatness of God. But something seems to make us incapable of pulling away from these lies 
in order to believe the truth. Thankfully, it is to people like us that Jesus speaks these words. Verse 23 to 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. I just want you to appreciate the weight of what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, come on, here's a massive great big camel. I'd like you to get it through the eye of a needle. That's the tiny hole you see in the end of a needle when someone's sewing. You know, if you are faced with that impossible task of getting a camel through the eye of a needle, you'd be at a point of desperation. Saying, I just can't do it. Jesus' analogy about a camel going through an eye of a needle was there to bring the disciples, to have brought the disciples to a point of desperation. Jesus said, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, who then can be saved? Jesus' word picture about camels and needles was meant to describe the impossibility impossibility of a rich person changing their own heart. They've so swallowed the lies about earthly riches that they cannot believe that Jesus offers them something better. And should Jesus call them to leave riches behind, they simply cannot pull themselves away. They're that invested in the lie. The disciples, after hearing that, don't then reply, of course, the rich have more money than sense. The disciples don't say this because they recognise this as a heart problem, not a head problem. A heart problem that affects us all. We've all got sinful hearts. We've all swallowed lies about sat where satisfaction can be found. We all find it hard to pull ourselves away from lies and believe the truth. So whatever you do, don't think the moral of the story is as simple as, don't be like the rich man. I'm going to repeat this because I think it's one of the most important points of this sermon. Whatever you do, don't think the moral of the story is as simple as, don't be like the rich man. Instead, the moral of the story is, we are like the rich man in our hearts, if not in our pockets. In our hearts, we are like the rich man and we desperately need God's help to change. Only when we recognise this will we join the disciples in crying out to Jesus for help. Only when we recognise that we are idolatrous, that we do we, that we do lust after earthly things. Only when we realise that we've put other things in place of God. Only when we recognise that we've believed the lies about earthly riches. Only then will we join Jesus' disciples in crying out for help. Verse 25. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Jesus pointed his disciples and us to a power greater than than ourselves. For only with God's help can our inner hearts be truly changed. Learning to love the world less, learning to love God more. Maybe you need God to help do that in your heart. Maybe you need God's help to make that first step of faith, a step of faith that would lead you to believe that what Jesus said for yourself. Jesus is inviting you to ask for God's help to do this. Maybe you need God's help to keep taking steps of faith. Maybe you find it hard to remain joyful because of your earthly situation. Maybe you find yourself getting distracted by earthly things. 
maybe you find making earthly sacrifices for Jesus difficult. Again, Jesus seems to be inviting us to ask for God's help to change.